<laughs> Hello, my wonderful students. And welcome to the IELTS Grind. This is Michael, and this is... I'm Phil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Michael and I, we're, we're both IELTS teachers, and we've been teaching for a long time, and I think between the two of us, we must have about 20 years of experience, I would say. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about a couple of questions that we often get from our students. Uh, the first one we've got up here is uh, from Billy Bob, and he says, "How do I get the score I want?" What? How? How would Billy get this? Um, well, I think this is when you think about the IELTS test. I think it's quite clear on each band score what you're required to do. So I think the first step is really understanding what the exam criteria is. Uh, and once you've mastered that, it's making sure that you're not making any mistakes from a sort of a lower level. Would you agree with that? Yeah, um, I, I I think you're absolutely right that there are the basics of the IELTS exam. And honestly, I always felt like that was the easier thing to teach. Um, yeah. But I've always found that the IELTS exam, it actually has two things that it's testing. The first is your ability to take the IELTS exam, and yeah. this is like knowing the techniques yeah, to quickly do important. it. Yeah. And then the second one is your general English ability. And, you know, even if you know the techniques but your general English ability is low, it, it's going to cause some problems. Yeah, I think that's a fair point, yeah. So how would you go about improving your English in general terms, what would you say? Well, um, honestly, I found that the best way to really quickly move a student up in their general English comprehension ability is through reading and I, watching fun TV shows. I, I make my students do this fun homework. Um, I make them read every day for, it doesn't have to be long, just 20 minutes, but... Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be connected to IELTS. Exactly. English is English, so if you're learning uh, English sort of sentence structure, vocabulary, and you're reading on a comic or something like that, it's just as valid for the arts exam. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and unfortunately, to get the score that Billy wants, which is a 6.5, like most of you, um, he, he's got to improve both of them. Uh, yeah, and luckily you've come to the right place because we will be telling you exactly how to fix your problems. Um, okay. But... Let's 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 go on to this next question. Okay, so uh, we have this next question from another student. So, uh, how can I learn vocabulary more efficiently? Well, my first question to this person is, have you been learning from a list? Oh God, don't learn from lists. That's terrible. You're yeah. never going to learn that. Yeah, it, it's going to go in and go out. Um, yeah. They they I I've done a lot of research on this, and apparently you need to see a new word 23 to 26 times before it really sticks. Um, and on top of that, everyone has uh, two vocabularies, the receptive skills vocabulary, that's stuff where like, if they hear it or they read it, they recognize it, and yeah. then their productive vocabulary, which is uh, where they're able to use it in writing and speaking. And I heard something really interesting about this, it's because uh, we, we both speak other languages, well, yeah, me, maybe more than you. Uh, but we both speak other languages, and I, I really felt this. It's you understand a lot more, so through your receptive skills, you understand a lot more than you can actually produce. And a lot of people get worried about that. But you shouldn't, because um, it just takes time. So the way to become more productive in your language skills is just to do it more. The, the more you read, the more you listen, and then the more you try and use it, it will just come, and suddenly it will snowball. And I'm glad you brought that up because um, to the exact same uh, reference book that, that I was referencing before that said 26 times, um, this they, they recommend that reading is the best way to improve your vocabulary. And I agree with that. This, this is because you see the word again and again. Usually if you see a, a word in a text, you see it you know, on the next page and the next page and the next page, and those count as those 26 times, right? Yeah. And then on top of that, you get to see it in different contexts. A lot of people think that once you s learn a word from a dictionary or something that it's it's you're ready. That's unfortunately not true. No, in in one ear and out the other. Definitely. Yeah, and and you don't you don't even know the different contexts that you that you can use it in. Like I, I like to tell my students that you can have a shallow understanding of a lot of vocabulary, or you can have a deep understanding. And what that means is that you're able to use the word in different contexts, mm -hmm. and you do that through reading. Um, but What's this thing about collocations? Oh yeah, we were talking about collocations before. 
So we were saying that um, when you actually read something and you find a new word, you should always keep a notebook and you should put that word into your notebook so you can sort of remember it. But you shouldn't just take the word itself. You should be taking the entire phrase um, because of something called collocations. Now, um, this is something that exists in many languages, but in English, if I give you an example, uh, the one I like to give to my students is uh, I was walking down the street and I saw an old man. Okay? So the adjective old, there are many different synonyms for that. So I could say, for example, if I went into my thesaurus, I could find the word ancient. But if I said I saw an ancient man on the street, Something okay, it's, it's kind of close, but it's not exactly what we want. But if I said, for example, I saw a former man <laughs> on the street, <laughs> he may have had an operation. Yeah. Uh, or, or he's uh, dead. Or he's dead. <laughs> uh, or I saw a previous man. Okay, so all these words, uh, so ancient, former, previous, they, they mean old in a certain context. But with the noun man, they don't collocate. They don't naturally go together. And that's what we mean by collocation. And, and you know these collocations as well. Uh, we're we're going to do a really, really quick quiz here. Okay, I'm going to say a word, and then I want you to tell me the word that collocates with it. Okay, so here's the first one, rain. What's a word that collocates with rain? Okay. Three, two, one. Oh, I hope it's heavy. Yep, yep, heavy <laughs> rain. Heavy, heavy, I was heavy rain. I was worried I'd get the wrong word. <laughs> uh, here, here's another example. Which one sounds better? I have a quick car or I have a fast car. Which one? I, I'd go fast. Yeah, it sounds quick, better. Quick, quick is weird. We Like, it has the same meaning, yeah. but no one would ever say that. No, no native speaker no. would say that. And now, for those of you who are super students, can you get this last one? What collocates with wind? I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong. I, I thought it was strong. Yes! Okay. Uh -huh. he, he is a native English speaker. Congratulations, yeah. you have proven it. I'm, yep. always, I'm always worried about that. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's the thing. When you're learning a new vocabulary, it's not just about the word itself. It's the other words around it, because although you might have a similar phrase, you can't use it in quite the same way with other words. And the only way to learn this is through reading. Yes, yes. Well, it's, it's definitely the most effective way. Um, and like he was saying before, the, you know, other languages have collocations as well. Oh, and yeah. this, uh, whenever you make a mistake because you're trying to copy the grammar or the vocab from your first language, this is called a transference error. For those English teachers out there who are watching this, very, yes, very fancy phrase. Yeah, I know, yeah. right? Um, and you know, this happens with collocations as well. In yeah. Chinese, uh, heavy does not collocate with rain. Big collocates with rain. So mm -hmm. in Chinese, you would say big rain. And of course, if you said that in English, oh, today is very big rain. Mm, doesn't. I yeah. understand what you mean, but it's it's, it's weird. It's weird. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, I, I mentioned uh, a notebook before, and you had a really good tip about notebooks. Yeah, yeah. So vocab notebooks are really, really important, especially for, like you were saying before, bringing words from your receptive vocabulary to your productive vocabulary. Um, the best way to, to get a word there is to use it, to play with it, I like to say. Um, and there are many different ways that you can do this. We'll go into this in another video that's all about um, vocabulary notebooks. Yeah, I'm sort ding. of going to link up there somewhere. Ding, yeah. ding. And, <laughs> and, but there, there's one specific rule that I always want you to follow with your vocab notebook. Okay. Um, you should always make it well organized. Okay. You should be including definitions, synonyms, and uh, sentence frames that use it, collocations. You should be including all of this. Okay. You should be connecting it to other words that you already know. This is called building schema, when you make a connection to another word you already know. And you really should not be using your first language uh, here. And there's one last thing, you should make it beautiful. Yes. Okay? Uh, I, have a, I have a question for you. If your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife is ugly, do you want to look at them? Well, I'm going to ask my <laughs> of, of course not, right? Be because they're ugly. So it's the same with your vocab notebook. If if your vocab notebook is ugly, you're not going to want to look at it. So yeah. you and, and you need to look at it because, as we said before, 
you need to uh, see that word, you said 23 times, right? Yeah, 23 to 26. 23 yes. to 26 times. So you, you need to be looking at these notes, uh, you know, the list of vocabulary again and again. But it's not just going through lists of words, it's actually building the connections, as you said. So great, I think some pretty good tips there. Yeah. So, so um, I've got another question here. Um, so how do I improve my reading? Okay, read more. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're, we're going to be going into more detail into how to get your IELTS score. There's a lot of different tips and tricks with the different types of questions. Yeah. But for improving your reading in general, you know, you should be reading for fun. This is what I tell my students. Yeah. 20 minutes every single day. Find a time. Uh, building a habit is really important. You know, write down what time you'll read tomorrow and try to keep that every single time. This could be like you, you said that you listen to TED Talks and such. Yeah, um, so I, I use uh, my travel time to practice mm -hmm. my, my second language, which is French. Uh, so I listen to uh, TED Talks in French. So that was quite good. Um, but I just thought of this. Another thing is uh, reading for pleasure. Quite a good thing to do is actually, if you've read a book in your own language before, mm -hmm. uh, classic example for me is always Harry Potter. So if you know a book quite well, if you go on and read it in a second language, um, you're going to sort of know the story already, and that's going to make it much easier to pick up the words and the phrases. And often you're kind of like, oh, so that's how you say it in English, because we say it in this way in, in your language. So that's a good way to read for pleasure, something that's familiar, because then you're not focusing on understanding the big picture is just what the, the way that we say things in English. That, that's so true. But you do need to be careful when you're doing this. Um, I tried to do that with Chronicles of Narnia when I was uh, learning Spanish, and I couldn't get past the first sentence because they were talking about a scar... Uh, a, what's, what's the word? When it's stiff, when there's a stiff piece of clothing? Oh, uh, starched? Starched, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there was a starched collar that was referenced okay. in Spanish. And I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> like, I, I don't even know this in English. Like, no one starches their collars anymore. Yeah. But um, you should not choose a book for fun that is at your level. I know that this sounds weird, mm -hmm. but um, in, in English teaching, we, we have this, this thing where I is your level. Okay? Uh, the letter I. Yes. <laughs> I is your level. And then when you come to an English class, like if you went to one of our classes, yeah. we would make things a little bit more difficult because we're here to help and support you. Yeah, so we so call that sure. I plus one. Okay. But when you're reading for fun, if you have to find a new word every sentence or every couple sentences, is that fun? Nice. No. It's, it's going to slow you down. It's going to demoralize you. It's, it's, it's just a really crappy experience. So, you should be finding a book that is I minus one. Now, some of you guys uh, may find this really easy because you know your level. Maybe you've taken the IELTS exam before, or maybe uh, you know your CFR, CEFR level. Um, that would be like A1, A2, B1, B2, B1 plus, um, and, you know, four, five, six for IELTS. Find yours. So, for example, if you're a five in reading, you should be reading something that is a four or a 4.5. If you're a B1 plus in the CEFR system, you should be reading something that is A2 or B1. Um, but maybe maybe you're watching this and you're like, what the heck is CEFR? Do, do you know? I, I do know because I'm a professional, but yes. <laughs> if I didn't know that, how, how could we find that out? Do you have any tips? Yes, yes. Okay. We, we, have the, uh, we have the five finger tests, okay? Oh, this is so good. The, the, yeah. the, way that you, the way that this works is you go into a bookstore mm -hmm. um, and... You, you go to the English book section, of course, and then you, you find a title that you think looks interesting, or, you know, cover art that you think looks interesting, yeah. and you take out the book, and you open to a random page, okay? It can be the first page, it can be the, the middle page, don't read the last page, yeah. don't, don't ruin the story for yourself, but go to the top of that page, okay? And then you start reading, read, 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 and then you see a new word, and because this is a new word, uh, you don't understand the story, or you don't understand the paragraph. You add one finger to your hand, okay? And then, of course, you just continue. Read, 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 read. You find another word, because you don't understand the word, you don't understand the story or the paragraph. How many fingers? 
Second finger. Right? Second finger, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's do it like that because that's quite rude in, in the UK. <laughs> so, <laughs> so so two fingers, and then we we read 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 read. You find a new word, but you still know the main idea of the story and the paragraph. How many fingers? Well, I I would say you keep the two fingers because it hasn't stopped. You know, exactly, it. exactly. And this is what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to be able to read fluently. That means not stopping, you just keep going, okay? And so you read, 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 you finish the page. You only need to finish one page. When you finish one page, you look at your hand, okay? If you have one or two or three fingers, if you have one or two fingers, what do you do? Well, I think that would be too difficult. What? Too easy. Too easy? Yeah. Oh, I was a to reshoot this. <laughs> so, <laughs> if it's one or two fingers, you throw the book away, it's too easy. It's not going to help you with your reading. Okay. okay. If you have three, four, or five fingers, buy that book. Perfect for you. Okay. If you have five, six, or more fingers, this book is going to be way too difficult. It's not going to be fun to read. So, yeah, that's... Okay, well, that makes sense to me, yeah. Um, but I wanted to make a point about... so. The reason why you're gonna um, aim for a lower level, because I think a lot of people will think, no, oh, I've always got to be pushing myself. But you made a good point about the fact that you're trying to read at a fluent level, and if you're always coming across uh, barriers in your road uh, in, in the progress of understanding, it's just not going to be a pleasant experience. So sometimes, if this is just what you're doing 20 minutes before bed. You just want to get used to the rhythms of the language and the, the structures and you know, don't want something too challenging. I think that's the yeah, main point, right? Exactly. Yeah. You, we're, we're trying to make it so that you're thinking in English as much as possible. And there's actually one more great thing about reading right before you go to bed. Do any of you guys have insomnia? Insomnia is when it's hard to fall asleep. Yeah, yeah. I, I this is a like great that. cure. You know, reading in a second <laughs> language, you know, it's, it's going to put you right to sleep. Your brain's going to be really yeah. tired and then... You're done. Yeah. I also want to make a point of, um, for some of you, you, you might be living in your home country where you don't have access to uh, an English section in the library. But you can still do this by going to uh, buy books online. If you go to Google Scholar, then you can actually get sort of um, it's a preview of the book. So you might get a few pages. You can do exactly the same thing. And you can do the, uh, the five finger sort of uh, rule. Uh, if you understand it better than I did. Um, and what you can do is after, you can buy it online somewhere, Amazon or wherever. Um, so you can still do this even if you don't have access to an English language section in your local library. A link to Google Scholar is here. Yeah, so googlescholar.com is quite easy to find. <laughs> also, um, this is something, especially for any English teachers who are, who are watching yeah, us. If you're spying. Um, if, if you're spying on us, yes. The uh, getting readers. Uh, English readers are really, really useful. These are books that are made for people learning English. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my favorite book is The Count of Monte Cristo. And it's about this big, unabridged, okay, huge book. Do you think you're going to be able to read this as a non-native English speaker? No, of course not. But if you look for a graded reader of The Count of Monte Cristo, it's this big. You know, the yeah. whole story is in, is in here easier English, and a lot of the times on the back of the of the graded readers, they have the level. You know, they may have the IELTS level, yeah. or they may have the CEFR level, yeah. uh, which can help you out with I-1. Yeah. I think probably what we'll do, we'll put a couple of uh, links in the description just to give you some examples of what we're talking about, uh, and you can check them out and see if they're a good fit for you. Uh, so let's go on to another question that we had. Uh, so the next question... Um, who, who said this one? I, I can't remember. It's one of our students. Mm. I can't remember now. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It's, gonna, it's for everyone, right? So, this student, whoever they might be, said, how do I improve my grammar in writing? Okay. Good question. Do you want to... Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll jump on? into this yeah. one. Um, so, the, the IELTS test, um, you, you want to be showing off that you have good grammar. Uh, there, there's four things that they grade you on, there's um, task achievement or task response, there's CC, which is how you order your ideas and how your sentence is connected mm -hmm. to each other, and then there's LR, which is just a fancy way to say vocabulary, yeah. and grammar. Okay. And one, one thing that I really recommend students do is they look at model essays. 
But when you're looking at model essays, you should be looking for how they phrase what they're doing. Okay? You should be looking for sentence frames. These are sentences that are really easy to change. Okay? If, if you follow this link, we will tell you more yeah, about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll um, another video about this, so I think we're going to see a lot more detail. But do you want to just explain yeah. briefly what a sentence so frame is? A, a sentence frame is a high-level sentence that is really easy to change, like the date or the subject. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how to change the, the pieces of the sentence, but maybe you wouldn't normally be able to say the sentence by yourself. Like, yeah. if I put you on the spot and I said, um, say this idea, maybe you don't know how to say it that way, but you do understand the sentence and you know how to change it for different situations. This is the whole point of sentence frames, is you're memorizing these sentences that you can change for different task ones or different task twos, and then um, you, because you've got it memorized, when you uh, see the topic of your task one or task two, you can just write down the sentence, uh, change it to match the data from the task one, for example, and then you're going to really trick your examiner. Your examiner will be reading your, your essay, and then he'll say, oh, this really high-level sentence, yeah. where did this come from? But what we're not saying is you don't just copy phrases, you don't just memorize phrases. This is something, um, I don't know if, if you're more of a, a coder, if you've got any coders out there. This is very much like a function that we use in code, where you're just changing variables. But the overall structure is pretty much the same thing. That's a lot different from just copying phrases and memorizing them and not understanding how to use them. And yeah. secondly, you should not be trying to memorize entire paragraphs or entire sections, because if the examiner thinks, like, obviously if it's a sentence that you know how to change, like the sentence frame that we we're talking about, yeah, yeah. like, you're, you're using that in a more natural way because you've, you've understood it to some extent. But if the examiner thinks that you're copying things, they're not going to count that towards your word count. So you should not try to write down a memorized essay. No, definitely yeah. not. Um, but yeah, I think we're going to go into a lot more detail in a, another video, which we'll link out soon. You can check that out, because I think this is really very useful and it's going to push up your score. But it's not only that, it's also for later on, after the IELTS, when you actually have to use the language in your job, you know, you might go live abroad. So this is useful stuff to learn just to be able to communicate in English. And uh, you, you have some things to talk about, with, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how you explain grammar to your students, right? How could I forget? How could I forget? Um, Very easily, apparently. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so I think it really depends, because with anything in the IELTS test, you can be doing very well in one area of the grading, but if you're uh, making mistakes in others, especially grammar, it can really bring your score down. So it depends on what level you are at the moment. So if you're struggling around, I don't know, fans call sort of five-ish, maybe something like that, often the biggest problem is just basic sentence structure. You're, you're, lear you're trying to run before you've learned how to crawl. So, really go back and make yourself familiar with the basic sentence structure in English. Now this is easier if you're speaking a, something like an Indo-European language, you know, French, German, even something like Hindi. But if you're from um, a country where you're speaking uh, Mandarin, the syntax of sentences is very different. And this is often the problem that we have. So learning that basic sort of subject, verb, object, that's really going to help you, I think. And isn't there a certain way that you describe grammar to, to most of your students? The... Oh, there, there are many ways that I describe grammar. Um, so I think I might go into this in a, another sort of video. But could you give them a brief overview? Of the yeah, three? so, I mean, you're talking about the, the basic concepts, right? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Three... yeah, yeah, three concepts. Okay, I love talking about this. Okay, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of grammar. I'm quite a lonely person. I'm the only one in the room that likes grammar. But, That's true. <laughs> but there are three basic concepts of the English language. And remember that language is just about transmitting a message. So in English, we use different grammar structures to give a different message. And the basic ones are simple, uh, continuous or progressive, and perfect. Those are the three concepts that we have. And all we do is we just change the time that we're talking about. So you can have present simple, obviously talking about present, future simple, past simple. And it's basically the same idea. 
So when we're talking about the concept of simple, that's just a message about an action. You say, uh, for example, I work in a school, and you're talking about that action. In this case, it's, it's true, it's a fact, um, and you're just, that's the message you want. I want you to know this action. That's it. And we can just change the time period. So I worked in school. You're saying that that happened in the past. Um, I will work in a school in the future. It's again, it's just an action. Whereas the continuous concept is you're saying that the action's in progress. And it's important that the listener knows that for the context of the message. And we can again use that in the past, the present, and the future. Uh, I am speaking English. I was speaking English. I will be speaking English. And it's just the, the focus is that the action's in progress. And the last one, which is possibly the most difficult to understand, the perfect, because it's about the result. You don't even really care too much about the action. If I said, for example, uh, I have washed my car, I'm not really interested in the washing of the car. It's the secret message, the result. And what would that be? The car is clean. Yes. That's what I'm focusing on. It's almost like a secret message. So these are the three concepts of English, as far as I understand them. And all we do is we play around with the time. So if you can understand the simple, the present simple, you understand the past and the future simple. You understand the continuous and the present, you understand it in the past and the future. And the same with the perfect. Okay? But I think I'm going to talk a lot about this in another video. I'll go, on, on, and I'll go on, on and on about this. So <laughs> if you also like grammar and you uh, find that an interesting sort of way of looking at it, then we're going to link out to that video and I will bend your ear about those grammar concepts. And and you know what? This is this is something that I, I've learned as as a language student, and that is like different different teachers have different strengths and weaknesses. Oh, yeah. And you know, different students click with different uh, with different presentations of yeah. concepts from language. So you're not only going to be stuck with this guy's <laughs> grammar. I will also be giving some grammar lessons. Um, yes. And, you know, maybe you prefer his explanation. Maybe you prefer mine. Of course. But you, um, might, you might like them both. So this is, what, <laughs> this is what the channel's all about. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So moving on. We have another question, I think. Last one. Oh, we the promise. last question. Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh, this is a good question. Uh, so how do I improve speaking? Uh, my speaking... Oh, I can't even read the question. I might do that again. It's because so, it's, it's my handwriting. Yeah. <laughs> so how do I improve speaking? So this is a, a speaking without access to a native speaker. Because a lot of you will be studying alone. You won't have possibly even a teacher to talk to. Uh, you might not even live in a country where we speak English natively. So how, how could they go about that, improving their speaking? Well, there's a couple different things that you can do. Um, there's, there's a lot of... There's a lot of basic um, there's a lot of basic functions of, of English pronunciation that you know even a lot of teachers don't know about yeah. um, and and th this is something that we'll be talking about here yeah <laughs> and uh, one one of the the best ways to to improve your pronunciation especially is to realize that English is a stressed time language now what this means is that the rhythm of English comes from the fact that some syllables are stressed and some syllables are unstressed. This is different from a lot of Romance languages, like French and Italian, where mm. every single syllable takes the same amount of time. Especially Italian. Yeah. In, yeah. In, in English, however, like if I say birds eat worms, and then the birds eat the worms, and then the birds will eat the worms, and then the birds will have been eating the worms, it takes the same amount of time to say each one. We'll, we'll be going over this a lot more when you guys go to the, the mystery link. Yeah, we'll link out. There's a, an excellent video that uh, Mike's done about this. And if you have no idea what stress time is, then you're going to be an expert on yes. it by the time you watch that video. Exactly, exactly. Um, but the thing is, I, I personally always found that pronunciation is the quickest thing to for, for students to improve. Yeah. In, in fact, most of you guys need... yeah. Um, and so, one thing that you can do is, after you watch the other video, um, when when you guys are, are watching fun TV shows to improve your general listening comprehension, mm -hmm. which is another thing that we recommend, um, after you watch the TV show, uh, you should go back and find a sentence or a line that you like. And 
or you think is useful. And then I want you to turn off subtitles and then listen and try to write down what you hear. When you turn it on, you will see that there are a lot of mistakes. Yeah. You, you have missed a lot of words. Usually, the words that you miss are the unstressed words, yeah. like the thes, the us, mm -hmm. the froms, the prepositions, yeah, by, sure. from, to. Um, and, you know, this is because you, you didn't hear them. Uh, and so, over time, as you keep doing that, you'll, you'll start to hear the unstressed words more and more. But that, that's the first step, is realizing where these sounds are in our sentences. The second step is after you write down and fix the sentence, you've got to fix the sentence. Um, don't practice the wrong sentence. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> compare with, with the subtitles, uh, fix your sentence, and then you should mark the stress. Now, which words are, are normally stressed in, in well, English? It's, it's the words that convey the message. So it's things like verbs are quite important, aren't they? He's, he's testing me here. This is I, I, um, I don't believe he's a native speaker. <laughs> you know, the verbs, the nouns, it's things like that. You're not going to stress so much things like the articles because it doesn't matter that much. Because, in fact, if you take that example sentence that you've taken from the, the, uh, the Netflix or whatever you've been watching, if you were to remove the unstressed words, you'd still get the message. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're not saying don't speak like that. You'll sound like a <laughs> crazy person. <laughs> but... That is the way that English works. We, we put the stress on the important words because that, that those are the words that convey the message. And, and there's a test that you can do. Uh, normally, the, the, we, we call them content and function words. Okay? Content words are the words that have a message, and function words are ones that don't. And the way that you can test if it's a function or content word is usually if you can see it in your head. Oh, yeah, this, if, is, a good this if, is a good test. If I say bird... Okay. Can you see a bird in your head, in your imagination? I hope so. Okay. It's a big yellow one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same with, with eat. Like, if I say eat, can you see that in your head? Yeah. But if I say the, did your head explode? <laughs> How about will? Can you see that? Well, I do know a guy called Will, but... Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, these, these little words, if you try to visualize them, there's nothing, because they have no, they, there's, there's no message behind them. They have no meaning. Uh, so, yeah. Um, what you're going to want to do is, is mark the stressed words with, usually I say a little dot above each word, and then you're going to want to listen and say. And this is, this is crazy effective for fixing your pronunciation. Once you realize where the little words are, and once you're able to start trying to copy the flow of the sentence, just like you hear it in your TV show, um, you will start to change your pronunciation. I, I have this really crazy story where I was teaching this student one-on-one, -on -one and uh, she, she uh, I, I had her doing this homework every single day. You know, it doesn't take that long. It takes maybe three to five minutes mm -hmm. to, you know, write down your sentence, fix it, mark the stress, listen and say five to seven times, okay? And so... I'm obviously, if you can't tell, I'm American. I have an American accent, okay? And my student was watching a British TV show called The Crown, by the oh, way. Oh, I love that show. Yes. It's, <laughs> I love that show. So that, that, that show is with British English, right? Yeah, yeah. And so she, she, was, she was listening and saying she was copying the sentences, and then over time, as she got better and better at it, I made her start to memorize them, and then I made her start to uh, do entire passages instead of just sentences. And I, I swear, at the end of a month or a month and a half, she had a British accent. It was really weird because I, I can't do a British accent. If I try to do a British accent, hope oh, hit me. Oh, it's it's <laughs> I might terrible. Laugh at you, laugh at you. Yes. <laughs> um, but okay, I, I just want to jump in here, and I, I want to say that you do not need to have an American or British accent to get a good score in the arts. And we're not saying you must speak the way we do. We're saying you need to speak in the way that the language works. So you can still uh, work on your pronunciation, but you don't have to walk around sounding like a cockney. Okay? <laughs> so, I mean, that's a fair thing, isn't it? I mean, we're not trying to make everyone sound exactly like the way we do. I don't know. But I as, would love everyone to sound like me. <laughs> but as, as, as close as you can, because there is no such thing as an American accent or British accent. Uh, if I travel 20 minutes 
down the road in London, people speak very differently to the way I do. It's because you Brits are weird. Well, we are weird. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's the that's thing. And um, the other point I want to make is it doesn't matter if you're practicing British or American TV shows. Um, you can, if you're learning American English in, in your school or in your country, that's absolutely fine. If you're learning British English, well, obviously we know that's better, but it doesn't make any difference. But the tips that we're giving you, that's going to help you go from your native pronunciation to closer to the way that a native English speaker will say words. And it will happen really fast. Yeah. I, I promise. If you if you do this right, you got to mark the stress, you got to fix the sentences, and then you got to listen to say. And if you're feeling fancy, memorizing it helps. But yeah. you will see results after a month to a month and a half. And um, it's, it's time well spent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is especially true if in a month or two months you've got your exam. <laughs> yeah. So um, if, for example, someone's watching this video and they've only got a week, two weeks before their exam, what would you say would they concentrate in pronunciation? Because I know what I would say. How I, about we listen to what you say? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would say that if, if you've got a short time, time and you want to sort of improve your uh, pronunciation, you've got to find out the classic errors that you, people that speak your language make. Okay, and you've got to fix those first. So often the problem with pronunciation is um, you're trying, when you have a, a sound that doesn't exist in your language, you're trying to find the closest sound that does exist in the language. And that's often when um, the problem arises. So uh, the classic like one. Like right? Yeah, yeah. So the classic th or th sound. So in the or think. Um, there are, like I said, I think I said this to you before, there's only one nationality I've ever found that can say this sound, and it's Greek people. Because they have a similar sound in their language. But um, I, I talked for many years in France, they don't have a sound. So instead of saying think, they will say sink. Okay? <laughs> so this is a classic problem. What, what, was, what was that joke you said about oh, uh, the, the oh, Coast it's, Guard? It's a terrible yeah. joke. Oh, God, I'll tell you a joke. Okay, so there's a guy in a boat off the coast of France, and it has a hole in it. And he calls up the Coast Guard and he says, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. And the Coast Guard says, what are you sinking about? Okay, he's still laughing at that joke. It's terrible. It's really good. Okay, it's really so good. that's I'm it. I'm easily amused. <laughs> so if you had two weeks, find out what are the classic errors that people that speak your language make when they're speaking English and concentrate on those. And you're lucky that you're learning English because the ESL industry is really big, mm. which means that there has been a lot of money and research oh, that has yeah. been put into people learning English. Oh, and yeah. um, I this, to learn about this, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's the, from CELTA, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. There, there are resources out there like that should be pretty easy to find yeah. where you can just find a list of common mistakes uh, that people of your language make in English. And then you can really focus on those. Yeah, just Google. G Google in English. Like, yes. common mistakes uh, Chinese speakers make. Common mistakes uh, it, Italian speakers make when they're speaking English. And you'll, you'll find a whole list and just concentrate on those things. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. Uh, any other tips you'd give for improving pronunciation? Um, if you have your own question, please leave it in the comments down below. Yeah. Um, and we will get to it as soon as we can. Yeah, anything you uh, have always wanted to know, anything you're really struggling about, yeah, leave us a comment. We'll either give you a direct answer or if it's quite an interesting question, we might even make a video about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think that's probably all our questions for today. Yeah. Okay. So don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel because we're here for a long time and we've given, given you a lot more content like this. And yeah, of course, leave a comment and don't forget uh, to share the video. If you've found this useful and you think a friend might find it useful, send them the link. And so. don't forget to check out the things that we mentioned before. Um, if you have those specific problems, that's what they're there for. Yeah. Uh, and remember, IELTS isn't easy. Nah, it's a grind. <laughs> so. Peace. See you later. <laughs>